Father, thanks for a chance to meet today as we dig into your word and into this whole topic of spiritual gifts. I just pray that like a puzzle with the scattered pieces that slowly but surely you're putting them together for each person here and those that watch online so that they begin to get a clearer and clearer sense of uh, how you've gifted them, how you want to use them. And Lord, I was, I was talking after service. It's interesting because the more you serve in your giftedness, the more it confirms what that gift is and gifts are. And so I just pray that you would give clarity and then invite them into ministry that would give confirmation. Mm -hmm. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What we're going to do now is, uh, this is the part of the training that I think is really important because, <clears throat> you know, some people just settle for doing something. And if you really settle for just doing something, it may be meaningful, but there's a lot of times where it's just not energizing. And the first chance you get to bail or it's like you do it because it's like, yeah, they don't really need me. And it's because you don't feel like, hey, this is how God's wired me. I ought to be doing it this way for these reasons. And so I just encourage you as we go through this to really think this through. And, you know, when it, we talk about style, passions, and, and this profile, <clears throat> I always remind people, the hardest part is we all project who we want to be. And so you got to be pretty secure in this to be excited about who you are and who you're not to probably get the most accurate profile. So if this takes a little time, don't feel bad about it, but I think you got to wrestle with it. And that's where, as I've told you before, with the assessments and such, talking to people that know you well, that perhaps you've served in ministry with uh, more than once, also can be great feedback to kind of confirm, is this like really who I am? So some of this stuff is really straightforward, but I think sometimes we also don't really think about it to the degree where we really go, is my head and my heart aligned with what God is calling me to do? Okay, it's kind of the idea here, head and heart. So we talk about the kind of people that we're dealing with that potentially are ways of discerning who you are. And um, the first thing I talk about is people that are, you know, passionate about, excited about a people group. And so it might be a minority group. It might be uh, a, a group that has special needs. It might be uh, something we have a unique heart for. And that can impact what we do and don't. As Jan and I were talking after the service, you know, sometimes, you know, especially church art size, you don't have 10,000 options. So when you're using these metrics to kind of discern where you are, you know, you might go, yeah, but like, I want to work with uh, uh, people that are, you know, refugees from Afghanistan. Uh, okay, well, we don't have that ministry. So, okay, then where do I serve? And we were talking, sometimes it may be to connect with a ministry outside the church that is ministering to those people. Sometimes what it is is going, yeah, in any given situation, everything I'm passionate about or is most important to me may not be there, but if I'm going, you know, Afghanistan and refugees, maybe it's people groups with financial challenges and cultural challenges. Well, there's more than Afghanistan and refugees that would fit that, so you then go, okay, and like I was telling her, I'll give you a great example of this, is um, uh, after the spiritual gifts training uh, sermons, the uh, two different gals had said, do you have anything, like I'm a person, I just, I love to talk to shut-ins and be there for people that are just, you know, don't have people encouraging them. And, and, and I was stunned that two people said it. And so I said, yeah, we used to have it during COVID and, uh, I, I've got some material if you want to talk about it. And not only both ladies go, this is great, but backstory, one of them does some of this professionally, but she's just a people person, caring, mercy person to the nth degree. 
So she could not be happier to get to do this through the ministry of the church. And the other gal uh, is older and she said, I stopped serving. I just took myself off the field and stopped playing. And she goes, just really tender, and she's like, I'm so excited to get to start serving. These both, if I add a name, it's like whoever says yes first, because they both are gonna go, oh, I'll, I'll do it. Because I wanna, and, and then the coolest thing was is the, uh, I was calling, following up on somebody, and uh, you asked how to do it, good, and he goes, yeah, some lady from church just called me an hour ago, and it was always oh, the most delightful conversation, and she was so nice, and, and I'm going, that's why you're doing this. It's just getting a sense of what is that, and zeroing in a little bit. They don't all turn out that way, but a people group can be in a cause. You know, uh, if you talk to like uh, Randy Campbell, who does a lot of our warming shelter stuff and youth shelter stuff, and Randy's a cause guy. He just wants to serve the poor, the people that are the disenfranchised, broken, what it be, life circumstances. And so for them, it's like, for him, it's like he just wants to do it all the time. Like nobody has to turn his, twist his arm or he's going to do it. And that's kind of the cause piece. And then the last one is role or function. And that, that really just it kind of hits to sometimes you just know how you're wired. I, like I believe one of my gifts is a gift of helps. I love serving behind the scenes. And like I know it doesn't look like with my job, but... I, that, that's what I love doing, and I do it all the time, and nobody knows. And it's because it just is very fulfilling to me. I like that role of just being the nobody sees uh, except the people maybe I'm ministering to. And um, so it's saying, are there certain roles that you've just flourished in that may be a part of where you land? And, and that always the danger with this is, is at least some of my past churches, is people who have led before assume that's the only way they could serve in the church. Then. So they hold out till they get the position. And that's not at all what this is saying. But if God's used you in leadership and you figure out the other ways God has uniquely wired you, it would be silly not to go is there an area of ministry, Lord, I could give leadership to with a team where we could accomplish something God wants to accomplish we're not currently doing as a church or something that doesn't have that leader? Um, I, I can speak to like uh, Tom Brown is overseeing the facilities team. And Tom's a newer Christian, didn't know him that well. I knew a little bit about his job. But when we start talking about the job, uh, being the point person for the team, um, I was kind of shocked. He was just like, okay, and so I'm gonna to put together some lists, I'm gonna get this set up, and I'm like, okay, I don't run into it. a lot of people like this. And it's one of the fastest transitions to somebody leading, and he's doing a great job, and uh, I just go, he's very comfortable with that role, and then you can see it really fits him. So, that's the role function. Psalm 37, 3 through 4. Somebody want to read that? Sure. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take the light in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And that's the thing is, um, if we serve for the wrong reasons, then we may be missing on delighting in the Lord. And that's why it matters, because there's always things to do. I think you'll find, for sure for me, I am not a arm twister, because I've just watched people just get completely jaded by serving when they got kind of guilted into something and they could never get out of it, and people would make them feel bad, um, or people who grabbed the position because it was power and you couldn't get them out of it, and the team keeps rolling over because people got burned out. Uh, not going to be, I, this should be something that brings you joy. Um, not every time, not everything you do, but a sense of, yep, you know, I'm where God wants me to be right now. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay?
Passion pitfalls. Passion envy. Somebody read the definition. Serving motivated by being with someone else who is really passionate about it, hoping it will catch their passion. Their passion. Ever been that person or experienced that with somebody else? Teachers. Yeah. yeah. What happens when you're either the one on the coattails or tails? What happens in those environments? Why does that not work? When they're gone, it's uh, it doesn't go very well. <laughs> Many times they leave because mm -hmm. it was never what God called them to do. But they just Alex is. I just want to serve with Alex, and that can be a, a factor. But if that's a primary thing you may be missing what God's asking you to do. Because it's just not, if you're saying, I love to with Alex, and I'm hoping he'll mentor me to be a leader like Alex is, that's a whole different way of looking at it. But I think this passion and envy is more than people think. And I always say, the people that are really nice, recruiting's easy for them, they not might not always be the whole adding to the team with people that are gifted for that. It's just people want to be with them. And, you know, you're not going to end up most fulfilled if that's the principal reason you're serving in a particular area. I think, like, I think our connections team, I mean, we just have, we're really blessed. We just have multiple people on the team that are just super friendly, like genuinely caring about people. And so, as more and more you know, new people have come over the last six months, if there's one thing that people say all the time, it's, this is like the warmest church we've been in. And I look and I go, I'm not comparing to other churches because I don't know why they're not. I'm just grateful we are. And maybe that comparison isn't even accurate, but I think it's true of our church is that we, by God's grace, have people in that ministry that just, genuinely care or interested with other, with others. And we have a gal, she was just talking to me today that's newer to the church and uh, has a, she asked me to pray for something. And she's like always tearing up in the service because she's just tender toward the Lord and likes being here. But she would tell you that she moved nearby here and started coming and it was, she felt instantly included. And so, because I asked, well, why are you here? Why did you stay? And she's like, because I just came and people just made me feel like this is where I should be. And now it's multiple other things that it really draws her. But I just go, see, that's, that's why this is so important. Passion projection. When someone projects their passion on you, what does that look like? Give me an example. So we're at the place, not to a fault, 
guess she does it, God uses it, but we're at the milk place getting our milk, and and all of a sudden I'm like, where, where's my wife? Because my daughter's here, like we're gonna go to the fair. And I remember seeing a lady in a wheelchair, but I, the lady in the wheelchair, like that's what I saw. Well, 20 minutes later, after she shared her faith, heard this lady's story, my wife is not as believing as she used to be, which is a good thing. She wondered if all the story was true that this lady told her. But I'm back in line getting a milk for the lady while she's talking, it was a long line. And uh, so we're all talking after, and you know, I was just, you know, my daughter's like, like mom, like we're at the fair, what are you doing? And, and like, she can't help it. That's just how she is. She sees everybody as a possible inclusion in her life. And so we're talking about my daughter's not like her, so she's kind of wondering. And then <laughs> we're at a different part of the state fair, and a guy comes up to her that's clearly deaf, and he's picking up right away. We don't sign or anything. And he's got these little Xerox pamphlets with little buttons on for a donation of $5. And my instant inclination was, dude, pull out the thing saying you're not a panhandler and I'm interested. And uh, <laughs> pulled my door, look at Nelly, here comes the wallet. <laughs> no, and, and so it was really funny after because we're like, so how did you decide that? She goes, well, I was so stressed out. Like, I didn't know what to do, so I just said a quick prayer. What do you think, God? And I think he said no, so that's what I did. And it's like, that's why projecting on others is dangerous because it's often done with people that are just so naturally sweet and accepting. They would never say no, even if the first thought was, no, this is not me. Does that make sense? And so that's one of the reasons why we want to do this out of how God has uniquely gifted us, the kind of passions he's given us. Seven passion indicators. Somebody read the first one. Body language. Speak faster. More energy in you. You light up. So what does that look like? So that's you. If it's something you're probably passionate about, have you ever noticed that in you when you get onto certain subjects or opportunities to serve others? Right? Isn't that pretty common? And and if you're serving in an area that, that never happens, it might not be the best fit. It may not even be a bad area of ministry, but maybe what you're doing isn't the best fit. But that's one. Uh, passion images. Images of what you dream of when you're thinking of making a difference in the life, and especially for God and His kingdom. So, like you can imagine, I'm preparing a sermon, and I don't consider myself a fundamentally gifted speaker, but I'm super passionate about the Word of God. And I'm super passionate about believing it has the power to change us. And so for me, when I get like a Psalm 73, I could preach five sermons on that psalm. I see it, I picture it, I reflect on it, I see people's faces, I think of stories I've heard, because that's why doing what I do up front is so uh, encouraging for me, and, and I feel like it's part of, oh God, has God has gifted me, because the passion stirs up. So when you're doing stuff where you're just like, say if you're in connections and you're like, I just had the best time getting to know this person, and, I love serving with this person and I can't wait for the next time. That's probably what it will look like as a person in connections. Yeah, I can't, you know, for Alex, and it would be, hey, he's doing, you know, some training with his youth leaders or something. And he's just, this would be great. And imagine if we're doing this and we'd be doing so much better ministry. And that's kind of what this looks like. You just start, can't stop like thinking about it, right? Somebody read the next one. Joy and success. Fruits of serving where we are passionate. So what, what would these fruits look like? 
What makes the person feel joyful or successful? I think that other people's lives are impacted. 100 percent. I think partly also just knowing that you're doing what God's called you to do. I, I think it's just a huge part of serving. I think all of us, all of us have done ministry that probably isn't in our sweet spot. And that still is important. But if that's the only place we're serving, we're probably not serving in a way where it's so aligned with our head and our heart that we go, okay, I'm, there's a joy I have in serving. And I, I, I just want to keep doing it. Um, absorbs. Time flies. It consumes your thoughts, time, and interests. You know, I remember talking with a couple that was in, some of you know, that was starting a uh, uh, ministry to immigrants. And you could talk with them. They could just list dream after dream after dream after dream. There was no lack of passion for that. Um, this one is one that the fulfilling part of it is, I feel like I'm on the clock, it doesn't feel like I have to think, but I also also caution, if that's where your thoughts stay, you're gonna probably not be very fruitful. Because the problem is, you'll be in the clouds instead of on pavement. And that's where your passion sinks with the gifting, where you can actually walk through and through uh, walk out those dreams and passions with steps that move more and more towards seeing some of those realized. Because there's, you know, like I always joke, and I, Alex, I've never followed you this way, but so much of like my kids and their friends, it's all about passion. Passion and it's like this rediscovery of this brand new word that never existed, and you're like, okay, like what are you talking about? And many times you realize when you press them, it's all air. There's no substance to it, but it makes them get excited. I'm just gonna help all the poor people in my community. There, none of them are gonna be starving. Poverty is gonna go away. Yes, that's what's gonna happen. And you're like, so what are you doing? Well, I vote for politicians. They care about that. Um, okay. I just send a check once in a while when I feel really bad for them. Uh, okay. It's a passion in the clouds. And then they have life here on earth. And so it's a balance. But I, the things we're motivated by, we do kind of dream about. We get excited about. We think bigger picture. We... Once things are going well, we can get a little unsatisfied because we start dreaming about it can be even better or it can be even more fruitful. That's kind of what this absorbs looks like. Uh, passions that are fulfilling. You have a satisfaction. Life feels more meaningful doing it than not doing it. You know, I I was, uh, before I came here real quick, is I... Uh, I finished in a ministry and it got a little hard at the end and so I wondered was experiencing fulfilling uh, like I had in many years of ministry. So I was like, okay, Lord, are you telling me to do something else? And there were things that fit other areas I was passionate, other things I had interest in. And I kept coming back to this and going, but is this where, like, can I imagine that kind of fruit that God has born in my life and the kind of ministry I have been doing is this new venture going to match that. And I really, that God really used to go, come on, we both know what I've called you to do. And yeah, this has been a dry period, but the story isn't untold. And that's when I felt like, okay, I'm not pursuing these things. I'm going to go back to the kind of ministry I've been doing. And I feel like God really honored that. But that's Part of it is that you, you have this sense of, I'm, I'm the puzzle piece for that hole in the puzzle, and I needed to go in there, and I feel right because God put me there. Uh, passion that's energizing. Passion increases stamina, determination, and perseverance. Is there something you've done in your past that you can think of where it was hard, but 
passion kept you pressing forward? Our commission trips. So how so? Uh, they can be very physically demanding uh, with different projects that we take on. Um, but you know that you're there for a short period of time and I'm somewhat task driven. So mm -hmm. I, it means I have to stay later to finish it up or push that a little bit harder to finish it up. I'm going to do that. But then at the end of the day, I'm spent. <laughs> yeah. 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 Great example. Yeah. Others? Examples of that? I think um, years ago I had lost a job, and when I lost my job, I also lost my insurance, and I had a, a tumor on my thyroid that I needed removed. And I, so I got it done at St. Elizabeth in Appleton, and I had to fill out all the financial things and everything, and, and um, had the surgery, and everything went wrong. Well. And everything, and I was still waiting, like on the billing, to find out how much I owed because we were going to figure out a payment plan. And they ended up sending me a letter saying that through this program that they had at the hospital, and they're a Christian-based hospital, and, um, all my bills were covered. And I thought, wow. So and they were associated with. Mercy at the time, and I'm like, how can I try to get back? So I started volunteering at the hospital just to kind of try to be paid. Mm -hmm. and, and I was very passionate about that. I, you know, I worked in the gift shop, I worked at reception, I would go on the, on the rehab floor and wash patients' hair that have been sitting in bed forever and their hair's like stuck to their head, and, you know, and, and I, I loved it because I just felt it was a way to get back, but then I I ended up working two jobs and yet I was still at the hospital, you know, volunteering. And so at the time, I was like, oh, it's getting hard to do both jobs and volunteering. And and I ended up just not volunteering three days a week. I don't know, like maybe one day a week, but it became demand, demanding at a time where I'm like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. But I still wanted to because I just needed to get back, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a struggle for me at the time. You know, what's in common is, and I think is true in this passion, is there's something that connects with us. And that's why it's energizing. It's For you, it was the need, and I feel like they really rescued me. So I, I just, I get that, and I want to be there for them. And, you know, and Jan, you're describing, and it's really like it fits with kind of how I'm wired and what I enjoy, and when I'm doing it, I can just do it, even though I'm completely exhausted at the end. And that that's oftentimes when you're in a place that fits you better, that's what happens. You know, Alex and uh, I have talked about this, and I want to give him as many opportunities to really discern how God has gifted and equipped him. And at the same time telling them when you're in the ministry, there are certain things you're going to do you're not gifted in and you don't like. And sometimes building teams and that can begin to get people into that that are more gifted. But I said, if he does ministry in the future where he's doing stuff he's not gifted in, he won't make it because it's too hard. It's just, you know, it's the exhaustion. How do you press through exhaustion when you hate what you're doing? Yeah. Not easily, but if you're energized by the opportunity of what this can mean for the people you're serving or caring about, I can do two jobs and I still am energized to serve those people. And it's like, that's, so that's a, a, an important part of serving too. It's not like it's always there. The question is if it's never there, maybe you're not in the right spot. Any questions on that? Last one is honors God, along with benefiting others and transforming the people in the community. This is like the measurable stuff. When you're serving and you know what you're doing really pleases God, you're more excited about it. When you know and can see the benefit to others, you're motivated by that. And so if you're in a ministry, like I was saying this to somebody on 
Um, and pastors don't like to say this because you're always worried somebody's going to think you're devaluing them or what they're doing. If I was standing next to somebody and I said, uh, boy, I said, boy, this is great. And I said, there's few things in the church I feel more not called to than children's ministry. I absolutely love kids. I will be one-on-one -on -one with kids. But I'm watching. I'm not a uh, dress-up guy that does dances with the videos. and I, Like, there's none of that's me. Like, it's just so cool. So, like, when VBS comes, there's very few things where it's like, go for it, Casey. It's going to be awesome. I'm 100% behind you. But if she would go, do you want to do it? Nope. Uh, I'll stand around and talk to people. I came the first night. I'll be there to say, good job. Thank you for serving. I'm excited about this. But I, I just, I, I just, I don't have it. I, like, I would like to, you know, I like to tell myself, oh, yeah, I could sit down and you know, just do a Sunday school class. I could do it. Would it stir up a bunch of passion? No. I'll uh, finish with this to tell you the truth. My first church, when they used to do children's lessons all the time, anybody remember the children's lesson? And basically what I understood to be, because I didn't grow up in a church like this, is you just bring something and you tie it into Jesus or tie it into the cross or something, you know? And uh, that took me many tries to start getting comfortable with doing it. And, and my, you know, I kind of enjoyed it, and the kids liked it. A lot of the adults said it was the best thing I offered in the Sunday morning, which was a good sign. But because they liked it, it was a really simple message they could understand. But but I just remember just always kind of like dreading to it. I just never got to the place where it was like, because people would say I'm good at it, so you'd think, oh, so you probably loved it. No, I actually did it. I was like, oh, God, I gotta come up with another. I loved the kids. I love talking with them after that, all that part I love. But no, it was it's just not me. So those are your passions uh, that kind of suggest indicators of what your passions are. Any of those unclear to you? So then what did, when you took the assessments, what did your life passion assessment tell you about you? Tell me how passionate you are. So we kind of clarified it and produced those that are in mind the same because it just gives you a starting point to kind of, it may not even be the most refined version of what it is, but knowing kind of what you sort of feel like is a, and it might be two or three things. Uh, one thing I'll just note, I know Katie and I have had this conversation in the past. If you have like six passions that you think are you're equally super passionate about, you probably still don't have a passion. Because none of us can be passionate about all kinds of things. We can have a heart for it. We can be excited for people that are addressing things. But this really kind of comes to, you know, if I had to choose, this is one or two that I would just pretty much always gravitate towards. And so that's kind of why I'm thinking this is a life passion for me. Um, because that's really important. I think a lot of us don't do the hard work of talking with God about it and wrestling. As I was saying to Jan, you know, if there's one thing I've learned about the whole process of discerning and then using your spiritual gifts is you got to practice in the gifting enough to sense what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. And many times people are like, yeah, I just, if I just knew what my gift is, I'd serve. 
So that's going to happen in a vacuum. God's just going to come to you and say, you're a teacher. I know you've never served, or you prefer not to serve, but I'm going to make you a teacher. Now go serve. No, that's not how it works. So some of this too, in discerning these things, is as you serve, what are you seeing? And sometimes you try things, you're like, I've thought about it, but didn't know, well, maybe you pursue that for a short season to see, does that make sense? We just had the MOT meeting, and one of the things I'm doing now with team ministry is saying, people that might have an interest, come for a month or two to our meetings, listen to what we're doing, hear how we're involved, what, how we're serving, and talk to God about it. And say, put yourself in there. Does this look like you? And we've had some people that go, yeah, I want to do it. This is great. This, uh, this I want to be a part. And we've had others that have said, you know, I'm doing this other stuff, and I just I feel like that's where God wants me. And I'm going, that's good. That's part of this process is trying to figure out what that looks like. So let's talk about passion confusion. Outside influence, others' expectations, passions, or convictions. Um, it is crazy. Like in some of my churches, the people that were most um, stuck were people who were doing it because somebody else projected on them. I used to do this. You're my chosen person to do it, so you're going to do it until you can't do it anymore. And we don't create safe spaces for people. Alex has got youth leaders. Is Alex okay with this? He's watching people saying if he sees the passion fade or the interest fade, you know, are you still excited about this? Or is, do you sense like I might be leading you something else? Well, that creates insecurity because it's like, well, I ain't giving up any of my team members. And so we keep people just pounding away and sometimes it's not where they're supposed to be serving. And I'm always like, if God wants them there, they're going to be there and they're going to be super fruitful. If Bob wants them there and it's not God there, they will fill a space, but they won't be fruitful. And then what have I told them? Well, I don't care if you're fruitful. I need you. Well, no, I don't want to do that. So uh, the outside influence can be uh, really uh, important. Um, People pleasing, that was pretty straightforward, right? This is this is just so hard depending on God's wired. I, I there's people that they, they got a free card Pasco, and there are other people that it's like like my beautiful wife that uh, just can't imagine. Um, not yeah, and I, I it's so fun to watch because. I'm a pastor, you wish I'd be more like my wife. But I'm not wired that way. And But I can super appreciate and acknowledge what a gift she is. But that can't be primary. You can say, I really respect Alex and he's doing a great thing and that's motivating to be a part of that. But if it's like, Alex is gonna be disappointed with me if I quit. Alex is gonna think badly of me if I no longer serve in their ministry. Uh, you got a person that's in the wrong spot because that's not ultimately a motivation that naturally comes from the spirit. Multiple passions, I just talked about that one. That's really straightforward. It's really, really important. Uh, maybe Jan's the only one on this on page 113. What is your answer to the where question? Did you do that? Actually, I did. But I just wanted to circle back to, to the scripture that you used. Mm -hmm. It was actually in my devotional today. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the writer emphasized is not waiting until you get to some place to serve yes. or to fulfill your mission. It says, dwell in the land and enjoy a safe pasture. And that's kind of right here where we are in the church. This is our land. This is our safe pasture. We need to serve Okay, so then the last one is, what is your answer to the where question? In other words, you know, where are you most passionate? Where do you feel like this is uh, something that's a key part of your mix for gifting? 
So you don't have to have taken the test if you already know. I know here's some areas that I'm just right now I'm super passionate about and I want to keep investing in the kingdom. Anybody want to venture to say what yours is? Use this or anything. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, because I just love setting up these kids for success so that they can grow and hopefully they can serve the, the kingdom as well. It's fun because I've thrown out other things in terms of ministry and he doesn't probably know but now he does. And uh, he's protective of being in youth ministry. So see then I know, okay, he's passionate about it. Because when you give people options, then you know it's passion. Because it's like, oh, well, I would kind of like that. And, oh, I'm going to do that. Whereas your passions tend to be, for a season at least, pretty stable. It's where I just feel like God wants to use me. And I hear the other things and I can do those and they sound great. But, you know, I always say for a pastor, I really believe strongly in the call to ministry. And I say to people, I'm always amazed because I'll talk to a pastor and he'll say, yeah, I don't believe in, like, God calls you. You just kind of go where you think maybe God wants you to go. And I'm always like, well, if I'm not called into it, what keeps me from leaving it? And the people who have known typically that don't have a sense of God calls us into things are the ones that leave as soon as it gets hard. And I go, still, there's my proof. Because when God's got your passion and you really feel like he's calling you to do it, you can be a great servant because there's going to be rough times too where the easiest thing is to bail. And you're going, well, I don't want to bail. Like, how do I prevent that? Serve where God's called you and say, God, until you call me away, I'm, I'm going to keep pursuing this. And that's kind of how... I look at this whole idea of really connecting with the where. Any of you three have a sense what passion kind of drives you that you're going, I you know, I know you kind of described it in yours. Um, for you two gals, any? Um, I think um, over the last probably 10 years or more, I've been working with the American Legion and Green Lake and I really, I joined the auxiliary youth just in honor of my dad. And I feel like since I've joined, I just joined just because my dad was you know, in the Korean War and just wanted to kind of respect that part of him. But I've really come to, I've really come to appreciate like where, and respect like the, all the, the people that served our country and, and that I feel is, has become you know, really passionate. So I, whenever I get an opportunity to volunteer over there, and I'm there at the moment. You know, that just is something that's really important to me. I'm not, I still struggle to know whether or not God led me to that, but I know that it's something that's, you know, so, and I, I love what you said there, Shelby. The, the calling always has a ministry kingdom component to it. So, 100% of be calling you, but then he's got a plan to use you to further his kingdom. And one of the things I was talking with Jan about that I, I want everybody to wrestle with is, you know, for your spiritual gifts to become really clear and like you really know they're yours. Two things have to happen. One is you have to serve enough using what you think your gifts are because that's how God confirms it. Because when you start seeing spiritual fruit and there's others that could be doing exactly what you're doing and they see no spiritual fruit, that's one of the ways God demonstrates a gifted use where yes, do this. The other thing that I think is really important and it's to me the harder part of this is um, when we start talking about the Holy Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit also is known best the more we invest in knowing the Holy Spirit. So 
if the Holy Spirit is, in, we're engaging the Holy Spirit only when we need him, or when he thinks he should do something we need him to do, or respond in a way we over, want him to respond, there's a lot of times that may not be the Holy Spirit that's leading you. You may define, be defining for yourself the Holy Spirit's role in your life. So how do you know you're hearing that still small voice? It's always going to be confirmed by Scripture. So if God's leading us to something, we can always say, God, now show me in your word, what does this look like then? What is the application of this? What would this, where my gifts are aligned with what you are doing in your kingdom? And it's that process where we begin to understand how the Holy Spirit speaks. Because otherwise, I just think, you know, it's kind of one of these things in the church where, you know, I, I meant to say in the sermon this, this morning, but I, I kind of forgot, I thought about it right after. But is, you know, in the church in America, you can pray the prayer, and that's all that's required to be in. And if you went to scripture, it actually would be hard to defend. But we don't talk about the church because we want everybody to say it, right? We want all our family members, so we hang out a prayer when Psalm 73 is actually a better demonstration that you're saved. Because a saved person goes, I'm getting this. I'm starting to learn this. I'm starting to walk in this reality. That couldn't be me. That's got to be God's spirit saying, that's true. And, and you're right, the way I look at suffering today compared to when I first became a Christian is so different. And how I look and navigate my life is so different. But if it's all like, no, I just do it all just like I did before I'm saved. That's a scary place to be in your relationship with God because we know what Malachi says and there's going to be people shouting Jesus, Jesus and he's going to say I never knew you so you know even in these guys I love your example of it is absolutely what is that Lord no I, I want to hear from you and I want to show you in scripture how if this is a ministry you want to tie this in or is it you know is there somebody you're going to save? And my being at the Legion Post is going to be the who I'm going to meet. And so I'm on a mission to listen and learn people's stories and because that's what you want. Or if it's, you know, some other application in this concern for these heroes that I'm going to be able to give testimony to you and your goodness and tell them, if you're excited for those that have served, let me tell you with somebody you'll be way more. See, now you go, ah. Oh, because otherwise, I, I, I do think uh, when you talk about using your spiritual gifts, uh, as Jan said earlier, the easiest application is in the church because you know you're pursuing the same kingdom, the same priorities. And, but now God does invite people to strive. I've had those experiences myself outside the church. But as soon as he does, I'm always asking right away, now show me the kingdom application to what I feel a passion to do or care for or serve. So somebody that says, I, you know, I feel terrible for people that are dying of cancer. I'm in a new hospice ministry. If they just tell me, I just go and I listen to them. And I think that helps. Wonderful, kind thing to do. But isn't that what everybody without Christ is already doing? It's in this service, right? So what would be different for me? And I was just talking with somebody, they were just telling me about um, a situation like this, and they said, uh, oh, I can't remember where it is, it was just today. But they were saying, I'll send this person doing this caring thing. Uh, oh, it was, um, um, was it here? But it was somebody whose parents were, uh, or family member was in the hospital uh, dying of cancer. And, uh, or I just, yeah, I think dying of cancer. And um, the chaplain came in and she asked, and How's the family doing? And, Well, we're all okay. And kind of navigate. And, yeah, okay. And, and then she said, If I want to talk to the guy, and, and this guy was a Christian, and he says, All of a sudden, listen to her. He's like, She's talking about salvation. 
in eternity. And are you there? And, and he just was like, awesome. And I'm going, hospital, chaplaincy, and say, is that just natural spiritual? No, it's not. And so, but God, I want to be a, a chaplain for you, not a secular person. So what does that look like? And I just thought, what a great picture, because there's a lot of that that doesn't happen even in the name of God, but it's, there's no ministry that's pointing people to the kingdom. So that's kind of the importance. So when you're going, what is my style and what is my passion? Those are pieces to say where I'm serving, does it fit? And as you put this profile together, each of the elements won't necessarily fit perfectly, equally vibrant. Um, there may be one area ministry you're in where two of them just connect really well and you'll do that for a season and maybe God moves to somewhere else and then the other two get more energized. And that's kind of the beauty of serving the kingdom. It's just, we're just trying to say, Lord, help me align as best as I'm able in the context I'm in because I want to make a difference for your kingdom. So it's not about me. It's about you. It's about learning how you've equipped me to be faithful to you. So it's really not about me. It's all about you. And I'm learning and listening and exercising, practicing, and doing these things in your power and in your strength, in your equipping. And I will just tell you from 40 years of walking with Jesus, um, the more you pursue it, the better it gets. The more enjoyable it is, the more you can handle really, really, by God's grace, difficult circumstances, things you're not happy with, leaders leading ministries, and you're like, oh my goodness. And you just have this sense of, but God, you're in control. And you asked me to be here, so I'm trying. And you get to see how God uses you. And the fruit is the thing that keeps you in it. I don't know about you, Jesse and I were just talking. We're living in a day, there is spiritual needs that are showing up in ways I just haven't seen in most of my years walking with Jesus. I, I don't think there's many places I go right now that I there won't be an opportunity to be able to minister to somebody because it's that hard and that difficult. And you just, when you get excited about serving, you're just always wide-eyed looking for ways to minister. When you see God use you and produce fruit that you're just going, this is so awesome. I mean, this is like, you did this. That, that's when you go, it's really not about me, but this is great because it's about us. And I know it's part of why I know how real you are because I see it in what you're producing in little old me, in perfect Bob. And look at, this is you. Make sense? So any questions on this passion piece along with your style of ministry that you have questions on? Some of you haven't gone through the material. Just remember, if you go through the material, you miss, you know, it's like uh, going through a Cracker Jack box and starting and never getting the prize. Come on, you got a dig gel. Ooh, there it is. Isn't that why? Okay, it's an old picture, but those of you that grew up with Cracker Jacks, you know what I'm talking about. I didn't grow up with it, but I know what the prize is. I've heard of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, it's like, I can't eat that, but look, it's a little hidden prize. It's a sticker. Yes, exactly Sorry. what it is. It's a tattoo. <laughs> well, let me pray for you guys. Father, thanks for a chance to meet today, and I'm really grateful for. Uh, time just to discuss this whole idea of passion. I, I know in my life, Lord, if I had to do ministry I was never passionate about, it would just be harder. I just know it would be, and it would be less fulfilling. And I don't live to serve in my passion, but I recognize the blessing of serving my passion. And I pray that for each person that's working through this material. Help them to take time, if they haven't watched some of the videos, to... Make sure they're caught up. Help them to spend time in the book. Just investing, realizing if they invest well now, 
and has a chance to produce great fruit in the future. And Lord, if there are people that have questions, that they would feel free to uh, follow me up because I, I do want people to be able to be excited about how you're using them and how their life is making an impact in your kingdom because you're leading in and through them. So Lord, just give them clarity, give them wisdom, give them discernment, and Lord, we're just excited to see them, if they're continuing where they're serving, to do it even more fruitfully, or if there are other areas to serve and that you can show that and they'd be excited to see the fruit you're gonna produce for the kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.